Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Matthew Jane, and I'm the Learning and Engagement Manager for the State Historical Society of Iowa. The Iowa History 101 webinars, presented on the second and fourth Thursdays of each month, explore Iowa's history from pre-statehood to current day. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at history.iowa.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you'd like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Now, a few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker for today. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the ca closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in just a few days. I've disabled the chat function, but if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague, Rachel Hansen, is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for this presenter at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not get to all the questions before we end today. And now I'm pleased to introduce our presenter. Eric Zimmer is a historian from the Black Hills of South Dakota. He holds a PhD from the University of Iowa and is currently pursuing a certificate in nonprofit leadership through the Harvard Kennedy School's Executive Education Program. Zimmer serves as a director of philanthropy at the Black Hills Area Community Foundation. There, he works with a wonderfully talented team to drive strategic philanthropy across his home region and help make the Black Hills thrive forever. From 2022 to 23, Zimmer was the A.B. Hammond Visiting Professor, Assistant Professor of Western United States History at the University of Montana. There, he completed his most recent book, Red Earth Nation, A History of the Squawky Settlement, which is available from the University of Oklahoma Press. That project explores a remarkable history of the Wisconsin Nation, a Native American tribe in Iowa that bought back some of its homeland in 1857. Meskwaki's story offers context and insight for anyone interested in the modern movement to reclaim indigenous lands in the U.S. and elsewhere. Prior to his time in Montana, Zimmer spent six years as a senior historian at the consulting firm Vantage Point Historical Services, Inc., where he worked on a variety of narrative, digital, oral, and exhibit-based history projects for clients across the United States. From 2015 to 2023, he was a volunteer historian for the Rapid City Indian Boarding School Lands Project, an Indigenous-led community research initiative in his hometown of Rapid City, South Dakota. Zimmer's scholarship and the collaborative projects with which he is affiliated have received high honors from the Western History Association, the Midwestern Histo History Association, the National Council on Public History, and the American Society for Environmental History, the American Association for State and Local History, and more. He has served as a primary grant author or co pi on several projects, securing more than $2.4 million in funding supported from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Winrose Fund, Monument Lab, the American Philosophical Society, the American Historical Association, the State Historical Society of Iowa, and the Center of Globe, Global and Regional Environmental Research at the University of Iowa and more. He's been quoted in Smithsonian Magazine and other publications. His work has appeared in Washington Post, the Indian Co Country Today Media Network, as well as other several scholarly journals. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Eric to begin the webinar. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Matthew, um, for the kind introduction and, and to you and everybody at the State Historical Society for uh, putting on uh, the, the webinar here today. Um, I'll just say, uh, you know, um, unless I get notification from some of the staff at the Historical Society that there's an audio or technological problem, I'll just kind of um, keep cruising through here. And with that, I'll just kind of dive in. And I guess in a, uh, just by way of a little bit of background, um, and some of this was mentioned by Matthew just a moment ago, um, you know, I was born and raised in the Black Hills of South Dakota, and I mention that because I think it's important for people to understand where historians and other scholars um, uh, come from and how they come to the work that they do, especially if they are, as I am, a non-Indigenous person working with Native American communities. So um, for anybody, uh, you know, listening, I'm sure folks are at least broadly familiar with the Black Hills um, out here in western South Dakota, but ours is a region that has um, a lot of wonderful, you know, things about it. It's home and I love it very much, but it's also a place, uh, like many parts of the United States, that has a very um, deep and fraught history between the Native and non-Native people here. Um, and I believe that that is sort of a central tension to the community that I call home. And it's been a kind of driver for a lot of the um, different uh, work that I've done in my life. And certainly one of the core reasons why I'm back here working at the Community Foundation and trying to work on some of those issues um, every day. Um, 
just in case it's, you know, kind of helpful, um, having grown up here and caring a lot about that, I sort of understood that if a person wanted to be a part of resolving those issues in a, in a constructive way, um, a person needed to not un only understand the history of this place, but understand the history of indigenous issues generally. And that's um, what led me to pursue my graduate work. I did a master's and PhD at the University of Iowa in Iowa City, you know, go Hawks, wonderful experience. Um, and the goal for me was really to kind of think deeply about um, Native issues, Native land, and um, what kind of kind of broad currents of federal and state policies have affected, uh, you know, Native people, um, certainly throughout the American Mid Midwest and the West, but, but more broadly. And the, the book that I'll talk about today is kind of the culmination of that work. Um, so my book, Red Earth Nation, A History of the Meskwaki Settlement, uh, uh, you know, took 13 years to finish. And I'll tell a little bit of the story of, of that in a minute. Um, but it's out and I and I hope people um, are interested in, in reading it. And one thing that I'll just mention before we dive in is that, you know, you can get the book from the University of Oklahoma Press. It's on Amazon, all those kinds of places. If you're uh, so inclined to purchase a copy, I just hope that people also know that um, when you write a scholarly kind of uh, history book, um, there's not a huge amount of money or royalties or anything like that for the author, just because of the nature of what it is. But I just want everybody to know that um, to the extent that I am paid, you know, anything for sales of the book, I donate those um, to the tribe, um, you know, usually on the advice of people out in the community and and mostly to the uh, Meskwaki Settlement School. So in other words, if you get a, a, a copy of the book, which I hope you do, um, please know that a portion of the proceeds from that um, go directly to supporting uh, young Meskwaki people. Um. And so this next slide, I kind of want to tell more of the story of how I came to this project specifically. So um, as I was saying, I kind of came from the Black Hills, grew up uh, out here, uh, headed out to Iowa City as a bright-eyed and bushy-tailed new graduate student in the fall of uh, uh, 2011. Had a conversation with my advisor, uh, Professor Jackie Thompson-Rand, um, who basically, you know, heard me out about what my interests were and how I want to understand Native issues. And she helped me think about how I could do a project that was local to Iowa, um, because that's something that's also important to me. I'm very much a public historian, care a lot about communities and thinking about how history can support, um, you know, local communities. And she said, you know, if you did an Iowa project that focused on Native land issues here, it, it might give you a different perspective on the way you think about the Black Hills, right? So in other words, I I could have done a dissertation, a master's in dissertation on the Black Hills, but I felt like um, doing something outside of that area could give me broader insights or kind of a comparative point to think about as I, as I embarked on this work. Um, and so it, it's also worth sharing that I knew very little about um, the Meskwaki Nation, um, when I started this project, I knew very little about, um, you know, history generally, but indigenous history, certainly east of the Missouri River. Um, I find, as I'm sure many people, you know, listening have that there's there's a strong geographic divide kind of West River and East River. We experience it in South Dakota. And I, you know, grew up in and was much more familiar to that point in my life with the, the history of the American West. And so coming out to the Midwest was certainly an, a learning experience for me. And then the next thing that uh, Professor Rand said to me was, you should go down um, Iowa Avenue, so from the Pentecrest uh, on the University of Iowa campus, it's a few blocks down to the State Historical Society of Iowa's office in Iowa City, uh, where a longtime um, um, historical society employee and um, you know savior of many an Iowa historian named Mary Bennett worked. And Mary, in addition to being a wonderful person and historian in her own right, who's become a dear friend, is somebody who had a lot of a knowledge about um, Meskwaki and broader, broader indigenous issues, but also had a lot of um, relationships on the, on the settlement. So Mary said, you know, here's a bunch of books and articles and things you could read to get up to speed. Um, but then also, um, I'm headed out to the settlement here in a couple of weeks. Uh, do you want to ride with me? And so I said, sure. And I tell all of this story again, because it helps you understand how I came to the work and what I ended up doing. The picture here is actually from a couple of years later, but it was in the museum that um, I helped volunteer to work with um, some uh, tribal members. So at the far left, this image is Jonathan Buffalo, who's the Meskwaki Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. Um, there's several other folks in the image, but Mary Young Bear um, standing right next to me in the picture in the white 
um, is the museum conservator and also did the artwork that appears on the cover of my book and, and throughout the book. She's a really wonderful, talented artist. And then over at far right is um, uh, Donald Wanati, a, a Meskwaki elder who, who re uh, passed away a couple of years ago. Um, and these are sort of relationships and, and, and you know, people that I got to know very well and, and consider partners in this project uh, from the very beginning. And in some one of my first kind of interactions I was coming out to the settlement and I just, you, you know, tried to do my best to demonstrate that I was coming to this work from a position of, you know, partnership and to be a, a, recipro a reciprocal partner and collaborator in helping do something that the community um, might might find value in. And so one way of doing that was to help volunteer to set up the museum. I helped paint the, the ceiling that you see kind of in the picture here, cleaned out an old janitor's closet and turned it into an office for Mary Young Bear. And then over time, as I got to know um, some of the folks in the, in the picture and others, I just said to Jonathan one day, um, you know, you know, you know a little bit who I am and what I want to do and that sort of thing. And I said, um, is there a project that I could do for the Meskwaki Nation that um, the community finds value in? And Jonathan thought for a little while and he said, you know, people in our community debate our tribal constitution, which was created in the 1930s. And just like the U.S. Constitution, people have different kind of interpretations about it and disagreements about it and that sort of thing. Uh, but he said, I don't just don't know that um, that many people kind of understand where it came from. And so if you could do your master's thesis on where the tribal constitution came from, that would be really helpful. And so I said, um, of course, happy to do that. And that's what I did. And so I dug into the, um, you know, the research. Um, and one of the things that, you know, came to the surface very quickly was understanding that a lot of what the community was wrestling with in the 1930s as they created their tribal constitution were questions about who on the settlement would have the authority to make changes to the way tribal members use the Meskwaki settlement itself as a land base, right? So in order to understand that, I basically said to myself, if you want to know what's going on with the settlement and the tribal constitution and tribal politics and policies and all of that in the 1930s, you really need to understand what was going on with the tribe's settlement purchase in the 1850s. And it's just this remarkable story that we'll talk more about uh, over the course of, of the, the session here. But for anybody who may not know, the Meskwaki Nation uh, purchased 80 acres of land along the Iowa River in, in 1857. Um, and before that had been removed down to a, a reservation in Kansas and Oklahoma, came back, purchased their land. And today the settlement is over 8,000 acres. So my project went from this kind of kernel of an idea about the um, um, constitution to being an exploration of the meaning of that uh, settlement purpose to the community purchase and to the community and what that meant for their uh, the tribe's ability to kind of leverage itself against the federal and state governments around it over the latter part of the 19th century until by the time I finished my master's and started thinking about doing a dissertation, you know, the next question was, so so what did all of this mean for the last 165 years of Meskwaki history? And so that's what my dissertation did. So again, just to follow the logic pattern here, sort of started with the 1930s, went back to the 1850s to understand that, and then extended that project as a dissertation forward up to uh, the present day. And then when I got out of grad school, um, you know, I had some conversations with Jonathan and 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 Suzanne uh, Wanati, his, his partner and another wonderful person on the settlement, Mary, other folks, about what it would mean to turn this into a book. And I also got the book contract with um, the University of Oklahoma. And as I started thinking about what it would take to turn this master's that became a dissertation into a book, the other looming question is, well, if you want to understand how the tribe, um, why it's so important that the tribe purchased its land and did all these interesting things with it, you probably first have to understand the story of how the tribe lost its land base in, in the first place, right? So that's how the book kind of became what, what you'll see if you um, if you get a copy. It's a 400-year history of where Meskwaki people came from, how they established Iowa as a homeland, how they were removed from that place, how and why they purchased the settlement, and then over the last 165 years, what that kind of meant, meant for them. And I take all of this as a case study for kind of the, the broader pattern of 
um, tribal land reclamation throughout throughout the United States. And so to kind of take a step back and help you all kind of understand how I think about this or thought, you know, have been thinking about it um, for many years now. Um, I think everybody listening is probably somewhat familiar with um, the taking of indigenous land in the United States. So this image was created by my friends at the Center for American Indian Research and Native Studies out on the Pine Ridge Reservation, which is um, fairly close to where I live in, in Rapid City. Um, and the image at left shows what Native North America, you know, looked like um, to Native people in, in, in terms of tribal uh, control and, you know, own what we, we would call ownership today as of early October 1492. In other words, all of Canada, the U.S., and what is now Mexico was in Indigenous hands, right? Fast forward a couple hundred years, and by 2014, um, all that is left of tribal land holdings uh, are shown on that sort of image on the right. So it's this kind of small spattering that looks like a bunch of little islands surrounded by, you know, non non indigenous land, right? Um, so a catastrophic for indigenous people loss of of land over the course of several hundred years. But one of the things that I think surprises people to learn today is that for the last 50 or 60 years, um, and perhaps even a little more, you, you know, Indian country, which is a, a legal term that refers to land owned by uh, and, you know, managed by Native nations, is actually growing and has been since the since the 1940s or early 1950s. So as of um, 1947, um, there were something like 46 million acres of tribal land in the continental United States. And today there are over 56 million acres of tribal land in the continent. Uh, continental United States, there's actually like 114 million acres of, of tribal land if you include at Alaska, but the um, federal government, the tribes think about um, land in Alaska a little bit differently. So it's not kind of an apples to apples comparison. But with that kind of, you know, understanding of the growth of tribal land over the last half centuries or so, um, I wanted to kind of dig in and, and really understand what that meant. And, and I always, when I get to this point of talking about this work, I want to slow down and, and make it clear to everyone who's listening that I'm not suggesting that, uh, you know, we don't continue to study the taking of indigenous land. The dispossession of, of native land um, is something that in, in many ways is well known and has been well studied and documented and people kind of understand it viscerally. But on the other hand, it's one of those topics that the deeper you go and the more you study it, the more you you, you learn about um, the dynamics that were at play and how how much it you know, shaped and continues to shape a lot of aspects of American life and, and government today. So just from left to right here, in this slide, a couple of years ago, wonderful historian Claudio Sant, uh, his book, Unworthy Republic, was a finalist for the National Book Award. It's about um, the uh, taking of indigenous land in the American uh, Southeast. Um, Professor John Bowes, another wonderful historian, wrote a great book called Northern Indian Removal that's kind of the corollary. So if uh, Sant's book is about the American Southeast, um, uh, uh, Bose's book is about the kind of Iowa, Wisconsin, uh, Great Lakes corridor that, you know, people are probably really familiar with on, on the on the webinar here. Both wonderful books. You should check them out. They detail in really sort of, you know, fine and um, and extraordinary detail all of the kind of processes that went into the taking of land, you know, east of the Mississippi. And then, of course, that continues out into the West through other work. But other scholars like Robert Lee, who I quote on the right, you know, have been have been exploring not just that sort of taking land from native people was about economics and manifest destiny and westward expansion and all the stuff that I think we we learn about in in high school and college but that was it was fundamental to the creation of the the new republic right so as the young united states was becoming a country you know literally and figuratively moving into indigenous country and fi figuring out how to you know control and manage it was part of the, the state building project that made the United States what it is. And so these kinds of questions are out there in the scholarship. And I certainly encourage people to, um, you know, read that work and, and deeply engage with it, but also to think about um, the reclamation of tribal land. So again, this is just three screen grabs of uh, um, news articles from the last several years that talk about tribes uh, in, in the United States, uh, getting some of their land returned to them. Um, 
I'm sure everybody on this call has has you know heard on the radio or in headlines or whatever. Every couple months, it seems like you just hear a story about a tribe here got this land returned or or something like that. And again, this slide is just up to show that this is something that's certainly happening um, in the 2020s and for the last 10 years. It's it feels like it's been accelerating, and it's happening from coast to coast, right? So far left here, tribe in uh, California gets redwoods restored to it. Um, here in South Dakota, um, tribes over the last few years have purchased a number of sites that are important to them, one of them being land by the site of the Wounded Knee, a massacre again about an hour south of here. Um, several tribes also pooled together to buy a place called Peshla in the middle of the Black Hills, which is a sacred site, and a um, just recently a uh, uh, indigenous-led nonprofit called the Cheyenne River Youth Project bought 40 acres of land right next to Bear Butte. Um, which is a state park and, and a sacred site for Native people, right? So certainly happening here uh, where I live. And then on the far right, tribe uh, buying back um, an island that they had lost 160 years ago. So right around the time that the Meskwaki settlement was being established, this tribe was, you know, lost its land due, due to some unscrupulous details of a, tr a treaty with um um, local settlers. And so again, this is just here to kind of refresh everybody um, and to sort of say, oh, pay attention to this when you see these stories, because it's it's happening closer uh, than you think and, and more often than you think, right? Um, and so then I sort of ask myself, and again, everything I'm talking about right now, I kind of walk through in the introductory pages of, of the book, um, is this to the question, so what is Indigenous land reclamation today? What does that, what does that look like? What does it mean? And it turns out it runs a pretty kind of broad spectrum or a broad continuum, right? So at one end of that spectrum is um, the most kind of physical and real form of direct land acquisition, right? So just this, this is the examples I was just talking about, and certainly the Meskwaki example, uh, tribes who, you know, buy or get donated to them or one way or another, literally physically uh, receive and, and retake control over a piece of, you know, physical real estate. Um, on the other end of that extreme, at the bottom of my bullet list here, are, are, are more symbolic things. So people may have heard of um, efforts to rename sites uh, back to their indigenous name. This, you know, Denali uh, for a time was called Mount McKinley in Alaska. Up in uh, Minneapolis, there was a lake formerly known as um, Lake Calhoun that was renamed to Bede Makashka, if I pronounce that correctly, in Dakota. Um, lots of lots of examples of this. There's also things like land acknowledgments. I'm sure folks uh, who have been at universities or other big institutions over the last few years have been, you know, just kind of taking a moment to pause and encourage audiences to think about, um, you know, what what came before and the fact that everything, you know, had been tribal land at one time and now it's not. There are, of course, critics out in the world who say that um, uh, land acknowledgments are, you know, just words and no action, but, you know, certainly I think a starting point for considering what to do with that. And then there's all kinds of things between that physical reclamation space and the, you know, more symbolic space. So um, there are federal programs that help tribes buy back land. So Cobell v. Salazar was a class action lawsuit, um, you know, filed by a Blackfeet activist named Eloise Cobell who for many decades, along with others, sued the federal government over the mismanagement of uh, tribal uh, trust dockets from the early 20th century. Um, won't get into the sort of fine details there, uh, but long story short, um, in 2009, there was a $1.9 billion historically large um, settlement with the U.S. government. That money uh, exists in a, a trust fund. Some of it pays for things like scholarships for Native students. Um, and and but some of the money is literally dollars that tribes can use to buy back what was called fractionated land um, from the descendants of allotment so that it could be placed back into tribal control. Um, there are things like uh, tribal federal co-management uh, projects, especially further out in the West where where I live, and there's a lot more you know public land, whether that's uh, national forest, um, national park service, Bureau of Land Management, whatever it is. Uh, a lot of uh, federal agencies are working more closely with the tribes in those areas um, to, to co-manage, right? So again, the land is not restored to them fully, but there, there's an elevated set of presence and um, level of participation. Um, there's a wonderful example of this that's both about kind of co-management, but also um, a, a, an actual restoration case. Uh, when I was finishing the book, I was teaching at the University of Montana uh, in Missoula, Montana. is just a few miles from the Flathead Reservation, which is where the Confederated Salish Kootenai tribes uh, are uh, live, and there's a piece of land up there called the um, National was was known as the the National Bison Range, 
Um, and in the early part of the 20th century, I think 1906 or 1908, um, the federal government took it from the tribe and turned it into a, a basically a bison preserve to, to save the buffalo. And over the course of the next hundred years, tribal members advocated very heavily to get that restored back into uh, tribal hands. And um, one, one of the COVID uh, relief bills that were passed a couple of years ago dealing with the pandemic, um, there was a, a rider tucked into one of those bills that that finally restored that property back to um, the tribes, uh, in it, or the tribe, I should say, the Confederated Salish Kootenai tribes, in order to be able to um, take that back under tribal control. And so they did that. Um, changed all the signage, updated the museum to really emphasize how this had had uh, been tribal land uh, prior to the creation of the Bison Range. So really interesting. Also, all kinds of things going on at Yellowstone and Glacier and all those those kinds of things. There's also court cases. So in many cases, tribal land has as much to do with jurisdiction uh, as it does um, uh, land reclamation. So you know, jurisdiction is not the same thing as reclaiming real estate, but but it it is important kind of to the conversation. So a couple of years ago, the Supreme Court found in McGirt versus Oklahoma, which is actually a, a murder case that had to do with um, where the, the victim's body was found on what side of the line. And in that case, the Supreme Court found that half of the state of Oklahoma for jurisdictional purposes is actually um, it, you know, treaty, treaty land. Um, so it opened up a whole new set of questions. A couple of years later, the Supreme Court stepped back in in Oklahoma versus Castro Huerta, an another case that had to do with a violent crime. And actually, the Supreme Court kind of rolled back some of its findings in McGirt. But this is just up here to point out that, you know, this is this is an ongoing dynamic tension around how these things end up playing out. And then I'm sure people have paid attention um, to various kinds of advocacy and activist movements that have been taking place over the last several years, whether it's around pipelines um, or, you know, sacred sites at, like national monuments and, and, and all of those kinds of issues. So again, this is what indigenous land reclamation looks like today. And it's really just a question of thinking about um, the sort of broad meaning of that and all the different places that it plays out. It's also sort of something to uh, ponder, as I did when I was working on this project, that tribal land reclamation has actually been happening for a very long time in, in the United States. So um, like many people, I for years thought that maybe the purchase of the Meskwaki settlement, once I, once I learned about it, was um, you know maybe the uh, first, if not the only example of this happening. You know, you know, and by no means did I kind of discover this thing about the settlement. I mean, the first thing that happens if you happen to go out and visit the Meskwaki Nation, um, as I hope everyone listening does, if nothing else than to go to the museum or the powwow or something like that. You know, the first thing Meskwaki people tell you when you go out there is, "This is a settlement, not a res reservation. We bought it ourselves." So people knew that. But I think one of the contributions of the work has been to kind of dig in and, and think about that as a broader trajectory. So the earliest case that I found in my research so far, and there could be others, were members of the Santa Ana Pueblo uh, in what is now New Mexico in 1709, so before the United States existed, started buying back Spanish land grants from the, uh, you know, the Spanish crown had given land to um, Hispanos as they're, as they're known, and tribal members started buying that back to reestablish that community. In Wisconsin uh, in 1832, a group of folks from New England tribes made their way west. It was kind of a removal thing, and they had some money um, as part of that process and bought um, uh, the space where the Brothertown um, Nation of Indians now resides, of course, 1857, the Meskwaki Nation. But 15 years after that, Jamestown Clallam uh, community out in Washington State, same story as Meskwaki's, pooled together money, bought uh, this acreage, and, and, and now they're still there. But this also goes up through the uh, 20th century, right? So both the Bar Barona and Vieja Spans of Mission Indians in the 1930s, uh, basically when um, the federal government built a big dam to create hydropower for San Diego, um, it pushed both uh, of those communities out, gave them you know money, and rather than using that money, which was paid to families, and those families could have gone and bought you know everybody bought their own house in the suburbs or something like that, they made the decision to collectively buy land back together so that they could reestablish a reservation and, and stick together. And then out here in South Dakota, uh, the Rosebud Sioux tribes um, TLE or tribal land enterprise has been purchasing land back and putting it under. Uh, back into tribal hands since the 1940s. And there's many more of these examples. And so I hope more and future scholars keep an eye on this and, and keep studying it. And so that kind of brings us 
to the book itself, right? So everything I just said is kind of background and framing to both help you understand what kind of the big themes and questions I was wrestling with were, but to also be, you know, really thinking about um, what this idea of land reclamation or what some people call land back, you may have seen that as like a, you know, a social media thing, like everything in the 2020s, it now has a hashtag, hashtag land back, you can look it up. Um, and it's become kind of a movement out in this area. In fact, both in Rapid City, where I live, or in Missoula and other parts of the West where I've, you know, been recently, you'll just see land back kind of written on, on billboards or, you know, people carve it into things on the street because it's a it's sort of taken on this meaning as being a position of kind of advocacy right around these kinds of issues and so with all of that as kind of framing to understand why the Meskwaki story is so important I'll then get in and talk for a few minutes about kind of the book itself and and what it covers so uh, as again the book is Red Earth Nation History of the Meskwaki Settlement came out this summer from the University of Oklahoma Press and each one of these four icons that you see on the screen um, were created by Mary Youngbear, my friend who I mentioned on the settlement, um, a wonderful artist. And each icon kind of, you know, is in the book um, aligned with one of the four parts of the book. So the book moves chronologically, and each one of these kind of talks about a different moment in the community's history. The first one at the far left uh, is about the kind of early migration of the Meskwaki Nation out to um, the Midwest and how the um, a process of dispossession occurred. The second one is called Settlement Sovereignty, and it's about this 40-year period that I'll talk about where the tribe, shortly after purchasing its land, was able to position itself in a really unique and remarkable way against the federal government to avoid some uh, kind of corrosive policies. Uh, the third one is called Erosion, and it's about um, this period from 1896 into the 1930s where uh, Meskwaki political power, um, because of some things the federal government was up to, uh, got to its, I think, its lowest point historically. And then the last one is called uh, Recovery. And the last part of the book and the epilogue kind of explore the steps the tribe took to rebuild its um, sovereignty and ability to uh, have self-determination over the, the latter part of the 20th century. So just to kind of slow down and talk about that first era. So one of the things that I think is worth kind of sitting on and thinking about together is this idea that a lot of times when people talk about indigenous people and talk about tribal homelands, there's there's kind of this focus on and kind of almost obsession with in some in some senses of the word, you know, who was who was in a particular place first, right? For a lot of folks, that's what they mean when they say indigenous, right? Um, and there are certainly Native communities um, who have been in the same place for a very, very long time and, and have been there basically forever. So out here where I live in the Black Hills, Lakota people will tell you um, that their creation stories tell them that they they literally emerged as people out of Wind Cave, which is a sacred site uh, for them in the Black Hills. And so their, their argument is we were created here, we've been here forever, and we have treaty rights, which they do, um, to this place. And that's what kind of affirms their attachment, right? But we also know that there's a lot of other indigenous communities around the world, the Meskwaki Nation included, who who were perhaps not from where they are now, but got there by 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 way of kind of forced migration and crisis. And so the first part of the book explores this question of where Meskwaki people came from and how they came to remake a new homeland in Iowa um, and to think about it as a place that could become a homeland specifically because it's a place of safety. So if you look at this map, basically um, the darker gray is Meskwaki people and or people of the red earth is what the word Meskwaki translates to. And then the lighter gray is, um, you know, Sauk or, or Sac people um, whose name translates to people of the yellow earth. And so uh, the Meskwaki nation today is federally recognized as the Sac and Fox tribe of the Mississippi and Iowa. There are several um, federally recognized tribes with Sac and Fox in their name. All of them would trace their ancestry back to these two core groups that are that are on the map here. And basically what this is, is Sac, which is Sauk, and Fox, which was a translation thing. It was a French word for um, Fox, which came to mean Meskwaki. So Sac and Fox is Sauk and Meskwaki, right? Um, these two communities sort of make their way from the East Coast along the Great Lakes and out into the Midwest several hundred years ago. And... The Meskwaki Nation um, was created, according to their own oral traditions, um, out on the red earth of what is now um, Quebec, Canada, and over the course of several hundred years migrated westward. And one of the things that I try to do in the book is overlay Meskwaki kind of oral traditions and cultural understandings of their migration 
with the documentary evidence that comes from historians and documents and archaeologists and kind of the scientific Western way of understanding the past. And the, the really remarkable thing is the two align very well. So when you lay Meskwaki stories on top of the available evidence, you get the map in front of you, right? This pretty kind of, you know, it's it's complicated and twisty and turvy, but nonetheless, you get this sort of trajectory of how the communities made, made it out here. Uh, so long story short, um, over the course of those several hundred years, Meskwaki and South people um, make all make their way out along the Great Lakes down into Iowa. Um, and one of the things that Jonathan Buffalo used to say to me was, you know, Iowa for us is a is a is a place of safety. And I would think about that. Like, what does that mean? Right. And so I would kind of explore and think about the different ways that Iowa could be kind of this place of safety that would lead the community to want to go there in the first place, stay there, and then after they're forced out of the uh, uh, area legally to come back and make it the homeland that it has become, right? And so that's on my mind throughout the kind of writing and thinking about this early period. And there's a, there's a couple ways of thinking about this. One is, you know, um, what you see in front of you now is a kind of map of the dispossession of um, South and Meskwaki land and what became you know, Illinois and Iowa and, and part of Missouri. So again, I'm sure people on this, you know, webinar have, are familiar with the history of things like the Black Hawk War. Basically, the map at left shows systematically how between 1804 and 1842, a series of treaties just chipped away at, at Meskwaki land holdings uh, and South land, land holdings um, in, in Iowa and the surrounding area. And then the map at the right shows how Meskwaki people were kind of moving and the, the kind of um, migration within and around the, what became the state of Iowa itself in order to, you know, you know, hunt and survive and use resources and all of that sort of stuff during this, this moment of crisis. So one part of the story is about the lines on the map and how they moved and how Meskwaki people were kind of forced out of place, right? And again, one of the things that we know is that the, the treaty in 1842 um, said that all um, Sac and Meskwaki people had to be out of Iowa by the fall of 1845. And so legally, that treaty forced the tribes and removed them down, down to Kansas. One of the things we also know is that Meskwaki people never left. So some went down and stayed with relatives in, in, in that uh, on, on the reservation along the Osage River. Other Meskwaki people um, stayed up in Iowa and basically evaded the federal government, which was chasing them down, trying to force them out of the state for a number of years um, and successfully remained. And if you ask any Meskwaki people if they ever left, they would say, no, our, our people never left, right? And so then I started thinking about not only that story, but this idea of safety, right? And what does it mean for the settlement to be kind of a, a place of safety or an anchor point as a piece of land? And my friend, Doug Keel, who's a professor at Northwestern University and an Oneida person um, himself, was kind enough to read the manuscript of my book. And he said, um, you know, when I read this, you know, Meskwaki history reads like Native American history in reverse. And I thought that was just such a wonderful encapsulation of what I was trying to say. Um, frankly, I think I, I wish I would have thought of it because <laughs> Doug had the better phrase. Uh, he's quoted as such in the book. But when you look at the map on the right, I mean, literally, when we think about native land kind of collapsing and shrinking over the course of the uh, 19th and 20th centuries, um, that little green rectangle in the middle of the map is the original 80 acre settlement purchase and everything else around it is the land that the tribe you know, purchased color coded for time period to get it up to the 8,000 acres that it is today. So when you just literally think about it as a, as a physical place, it's been growing and expanding outwards at a time when the rest of Native America is kind of shrinking inwards, geographically speaking. So it's a, a place of safety in, in that sense, right? But there's also a demographic component to this that was very, very striking for me. So if you just focus for a second on the map that's on the right, and, you know, I'll be frank with everyone here. I mean, I, I believe in this map, um, wouldn't have put it in the book if I didn't think it held, but the estimates of Meskwaki people and Sauk people were pretty hard to track down over, over, over the years. Um, a lot of this comes from federal government reports, you know, BIA agents, sometimes army reports, things like that. And it was very, un excuse me, very unclear, you know, whether, 
the people writing these reports um, were paying a lot of attention to, you know, maybe if there was a mixed family that had both, you know, Sauk and Meskwaki people, how they would count the members of that family. So these are pretty rough estimates. And a lot of this was in pretty turbulent times. But I think the kind of numbers are at least, you know, in a ballparky section hold. And I got a lot of these from secondary, you know, scholarship, other historians who had researched it, and I tried to kind of piece it together. But, but basically, what you see is that if you take and accept that by about the year 1600 or so, there's about 4,000 uh, Meskwaki people. Um, what you see is that the, the population of the Meskwaki nation has only grown twice in the last 400 years. And in both cases, it was when the tribe had a strong foothold in what became Iowa and the surrounding area. In other words, when they're in the Midwest, in this place of safety that Jonathan's talking about, um, then you kind of see the growth of the community and the health of the community. When it's not the case, when the tribe is being forced to move around, involved in a sort of violent confrontation, you know, being removed, the population basically collapses. So the Fox Wars noted there in 1733, this is a bunch of fighting between Meskwaki and French people and indigenous folks who had allied with the French basically around fur trading in the Great Lakes region. You know, the Meskwaki population collapses from three or 4,000 down to about 250 people who were all who were known to be counted by the French um, at that time. Um, so the community is nearly wiped out. They partner up with South people, make their way out to the Midwest, to this place of safety. And the time from 1780 to the 1840s, when they're kind of formally in what's now Iowa, what you see is the population kind of growing up to its highest point. And then immediately after the, the U.S. South War, people called Black Hawks War in 1832, this is a period when the federal government is, you know, focused on getting this land from both tribes, punishing the tribes for um um, you know, the, 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 the conflict itself, as well as disease and starvation, other issues, the population collapses into the 1840s. And then what you see is when the tribe purchases its land in 1857, the community starts to grow again and grows steadily up to the present day. Uh, with that one blip around 1900, there was a smallpox epidemic that killed a bunch of people on the settlement, but otherwise the community has really regrown, right? And I, I put this up here just to elevate again, this idea that, um, the settlement being a place of safety is is not only about the kind of holding and expansion of the land, but about the regrowth of the community just as a physical population as a result of that. And so the kind of notes I have on the left in these bullets here raise what I think are the central questions of the whole book. So what, what does Meskwaki history tell us about the promises and, and pitfalls of, of tribal land reclamation? And one of the things that we see, and I think is borne out on this slide in the discussion we've been having the last few minutes, is that you know, reclaiming tribal land is a fundamentally good and vital thing to help communities not only survive difficult circumstances, but thrive and give them the opportunity to kind of rebuild, right? So full stop, land reclamation is, is good for tribes. Second point, it's very complicated, though. It is, it is not... Um, Land ownership in and of itself does not um, solve all the problems that communities face, restore them. In fact, the whole book is about how tribes have to, on an ongoing basis, and the Meskwaki Nation certainly did this, economically, politically, and culturally use the land base as a piece, uh, as a tool, as a piece of leverage to be able to rebuild, to protect its sovereignty, and to create opportunities for self determination to do all the things that make a community healthy. And then the third point is, and we'll see this at the very end of the talk. Um, tribal land reclamation is not only good for tribes, it's also good for everyone else in the area. And we'll see that when we get to some of the economic development uh, initiatives that we'll um, talk about in a second. So the three high points here, one, tribal land reclamation equals good. Two, tribal land reclamation, much more complicated than you think in terms of what it produces for tribes and what its limitations are. And three, tribal land reclamation, pretty good for everybody in the area, it turns out. And so from there, move into the story of what I call settlement sovereignty. So from 1857, when the community purchased the settlement up till 1896 for 40 years, the Meskwaki Nation lived in this really remarkable space where um, they're able to repel a lot of outside incursions from the federal government. So in order for um, the tribe to buy the land in the 1850s because of the earlier treaties and some, some legal things, they, they weren't able to buy it themselves. They paid $1,000 to a farmer to buy that 80 acres but they actually had to give that $1,000 to the governor of Iowa, 
who bought it on their half and agreed on their behalf uh, using Meskwaki money and then agreed to hold it in trust for the tribe and then pass that trust down to successors in office. So for 40 years, the Meskwaki uh, settlement existed in this, um, you know, kind of uh, state tribal trust arrangement as various uh, governors upheld it. And what that meant was it allowed the tribe to be able to push back when the federal government came a knocking with different kinds of um, uh, policies that were largely aimed at taking more land and assimilating native people. So uh, basically allotment is one. If people aren't familiar with that, I encourage you to learn about it. Allotment was a federal policy that took about between 80 and 90 million acres of land, uh, uh, native land uh, between the 1880s and the 1930s. And it basically meant parceling up the land and giving it to families instead of the tribe as a whole and then selling off the rest of it. The Meskwaki settlement has never been allotted and was never allotted because the tribe was able to say, you can't do that to us. We bought this land ourselves. Um, we hold it in a state tribal trust. The other example refers to the boarding school that you see here. Uh, another thing that people I think are probably familiar with today is the extent to which um, the federal government um, was encouraging assimilation, trying to send uh, families to boarding schools. And I kind of raise this because, you know, it's evidence of how um, the Meskwaki settlement story, you know, was not uniformly successful in every case. The federal government did build a boarding school. It was able to compel attendance for a time and get Meskwaki people to send their families there. Um, the tribal uh, leader, Chief Pushtaniqua, who's shown at the right, was in, involved in this complicated um back and forth within the community over whether or not the tribe uh, in the uh, should send, you know, families should send their children to these schools. In the end, um, the tribe was, you know, successfully got the school shut down by not going, going and attending. Uh, but it just kind of elevates the complex era that the community's um, um, operating in. And I think it holds this broader point that I make about how in that period, the tribe's able to do some really remarkable things that other tribes throughout the country um, arguably were not able to do. The next period the book focuses on is uh, from 1896 to 1932, focuses on erosion and adaptation. So around 1896, um, a bunch of folks in the federal government, as well as some folks in white folks in Iowa, um, convinced the state to give up that, that special state tribal trust that we had just talking about. And so from 1896 forward, the federal government um, absorbs the Meskwaki settlement into trust, which gives it the power to treat the settlement like um, reservation lands elsewhere. And so over the course of that 30 year period or so, Meskwaki political power is just absolutely you know, crushed. Um, when Chief Pusha Tanikwa was on the left side, uh, last slide died in 1919, um, the federal government refused to name a successor. There was a tribal council throughout the 1920s, but there were all kinds of stresses and divisions at play in the federal government, you know, wedging people in the community against one another to the point where by the end of the 20s, the tribal council itself basically, you know, admitted to, um, in some cases, to the federal government that it, it didn't think it had the power to make decisions about certain things. So this is fundamentally a story about the erosion of political power. This period is also remarkable because it's about a lot of important changes that are happening on the settlement. So in 1901, as I had mentioned, there was a smallpox outbreak that killed a bunch of people on the settlement. But amid this broader loss of political power, the federal government and the state government um, actually put the settlement under quarantine over the winter of 1901 to 1902. And at the end of that quarantine, burned the Meskwaki village. So prior to that smallpox outbreak, most Meskwaki people lived in a central village on the settlement, lived in houses like you see on the left there, you know, wiki ups and summer homes and things like that. It burned the, that um, uh, central village. And over the next 30 years, Meskwaki people move out into kind of frame houses like what you see on the right, sort of Western style frame houses. And the book sort of slows down to chart out these big picture developments as Meskwaki people make strategic decisions to adapt to some of those challenges, but also, you know, establish new land use patterns on the settlement for families. But I also want to take a second and just point out the gentleman in the picture at right. His name is Sam Slick, and this was the house he was building in the 1920s. And just to kind of encapsulate this, this era, um, I have this section of the book where I talk about how um, Sam Slick's father had been one of the people who was the first Meskwaki leaders to come back um, uh, and establish the settlement in the 1850s, and he had a bear claw necklace. 
Um, bear claw necklaces are very important symbolic artifacts. They carry a lot of political power and meaning from the Squawky community. But, you know, I think both because of the, you know, challenges of the Great Depression and sort of material needs that Sam Slick and his family were facing, but also because this kind of broader collapse of political sovereignty that we see in this era, Sam Slick actually sold his bear claw necklace um, in 1932 to make ends meet. And so there's a section of the book where I kind of try to explore what that looked like and what that meant, both as a symbol of the loss of political power, but also the dire economic strengths the community was facing at that time. The next period is about rebuilding, as I mentioned. So from 1933 until 1980, this is when the community um, establishes the tribal constitution, which was contentious in its own time, continues to be debated today. But one of the points I try to make in the book is, you know, as a historian, it's not my job to say who whether they should or shouldn't have gotten this constitution, but to say that the community did get the constitution in, the, in 1937 when it was ratified. And what did that mean? And what it meant was it reestablished an opportunity for the Meskwaki Nation to work within the federal kind of system, within the federal framework, working with you know the state and the federal government at different times, to reestablish a version of political power that previously had been lost in that earlier era. And so on the left, this is a picture of Meskwaki um, uh, children who basically formed a version of a 4-H club using some um, depression era federal money to be able to, you know, raise hens and eggs and stuff like that to help their get fam families get through the depression. But there's other parts of the story are about the tribe using its new powers within the federal system to, you know, take advantage of federal programs, uh, things like that. Um, on the right is Adeline Wanati, a uh, Meskwaki leader who was a um, real advocate for education and also became the first a uh, woman in the uh, Meskwaki Nation to serve on the tribal council. So one of the many changes that the constitution in the 30s brought to the community was not only things about land ownership and membership and stuff like that, but it lowered the age on which you could serve on the council and it opened it up to women for the first time. So there's like big picture kind of changes happening as the community grapples with questions in new ways. And the other important part about this period is that there's these big developments that happen during and right after World War II. So prior to World War II, most Meskwaki people lived and worked on the settlement. During the war, because of war industry and opportunities off settlement, the community is able to um, go out and get new experiences, right? And a lot of young people go and decide they want to work, you know, in Waterloo or Cedar Rapids or Wisconsin or something like that and get jobs elsewhere. And so there's, I think, what would be a pretty natural concern as plays out in many communities where you have an older generation basically saying, you know, what happens if all of our young people leave and never come back? And what will that mean for our community? And a younger generation saying, well, we want to go out in the world and see new things, right? But one of the things that we find when you look at the records is that there's this terribly persistent poverty that the Meskwaki Nation endures from the 1940s all the way up to the 70s. And the average uh, unemployment rate in Iowa, for example, during that period was something like three and three and a half, four percent, whatever. In the Squawky Nation, it's like 45 percent. And what basically you find is that Meskwaki people faced a false promise. In other words, they were told if they went off the settlement and looked for different opportunities that they would get more jobs. But what they found was because of discrimination and other things, Meskwaki people are kind of last hired, first fired um, off settlement. And so what this leads to is by the 1970s, the tribal council is basically developing a strategy to try to bring the economy back onto the settlement and build an on-settlement economy that can provide for all Meskwaki people. And so they're thinking about this, they're writing about it, there's agriculture plans, economic development plans, all of that stuff. But one thing that no one could have predicted at that time uh, was that in the 1980s, just around the corner, and just a few years after the tribe started thinking about bringing the community back on the settlement, this is when tribal gaming would become a thing nationally, right? And so the last part of the book, the kind of recovery, re rebuilding and recovery epilogue, explore what it meant for the community to do economic development in the 70s to plan for that, but then also to establish the uh, first bingo and then later casino enterprise that made the, the tribe very cash rich uh, within a few years. And then how they've strategically used that to not only build out this diversified economic development strategy that's made the tribe very wealthy and, and successful, but also to point about how they've been able to purchase more land and also leverage all of that land ownership 
um, and economic success into more political leverage within the state and nationally to do really big things. One of the things that I want to emphasize is that, you know, the Meskwaki Nation, like any community, still faces all kinds of different challenges. Many of them are not my business. We certainly don't have time to get into them today. But I'm not saying that owning land and having all of this economic development made it a perfect place. What I think is it made it very successful and made the quality of life and the standard of life remarkably better and makes the Meskwaki Nation story stand out nationally. And as I said earlier, you know, the tribe is now the largest employer in Tama County. And a lot of the people who work for the tribe and receive benefits sort of broadly through the economy are non-native folks. So the story of the settlement's economic success is also the story of the surrounding area's success, whether or not people are members of the Meskwaki community. And so that's that's an important takeaway. And I think the thing that I'll close with is just, you know, I talked a few minutes ago about Sam Slick and that kind of sad you know story where he sold his family's bear claw necklace to make ends meet. That picture right there is the bear claw necklace, and it is at the Meskwaki Museum because just a couple of years ago, the State Historical Society of Iowa, my hosts for today, um, you know, re returned it back to the tribe when the tribe asked for it. So I use this in the book and in my conversation with you all today as kind of a sim symbol of the ways in which Meskwaki, um, you know, political sovereignty have been restored as well as the kind of health and strength of the community over the long term as they've been on this long you know, road to get to where they are now. And so I'll kind of stop there. And the last slide is just here to kind of rest while anybody asks any questions that they have for the last, last couple minutes. Thank you all very much for your time. And I look forward to whatever questions uh, you know, Rachel or uh, Matt have to send my way. Thank you, Eric. We have time to answer some questions. As a reminder, if you have a question, please submit it through the Q&A feature on Zoom. And please note, we may not be able to get to all of your questions. Eric, we do have a few questions that have come through. Uh, first, uh, a question about land reclamation and the recent decisions in Oklahoma, and to what extent those have had an effect on checkerboarding on Indian country lands. Um. I don't, so I don't, I'm, I'm not somebody who spent a lot of time in Oklahoma or a specialist down there. Um, what I can say is that some of those issues around McGirt and these broader cases um, have, you know, um, they're about, they're about tribal jurisdiction and the extension of, you know, kind of, you know, criminal jurisdiction and provisions that are about treaty law. Um, they have very, very little, I think, to do with, you um, checkerboarding and land that was lost to allotment and that sort of thing. So to my knowledge, none of these findings or any of these Supreme Court cases in the last few years have, for example, you know, restore, restored any, you know, land in those places. So um, maybe that's not a satisfying answer, but that's kind of what I know for now. We have another question uh, about uh, whether or not other tribes have followed the Meskwaki example in land purchase and economic development, if there have been some key lessons that you know, other indigenous nations have learned. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, I wouldn't say that it's as sort of cut and dry as one community learns from the next community, right? I think it's kind of an ecosystem where ideas are shared and kind of spread and, and that sort of thing. But you know, for example, the Squawky Nation, as I, as I made fairly clear, you know, we're a leader in this kind of remarkable story of reclaiming the land itself. Um, I think if you look further west into part of Iowa and over into Nebraska, you know, um, Ho-Chunk Inc. It, over the last 20 or 30 years was the tribe, uh, the community and in, in, in the economic development um, case or, or entity in this case, who, who really kind of demonstrated, I think, for tribes everywhere um, certainly in the Midwest, how how diversified economic development based on kind of the special legal status that tribes have um, can create these kinds of opportunities. And uh, again, I haven't talked to anybody explicitly about this on the settlement or anything like that, but I would guess that people in Meskwaki government and the you know economic development office, things like that, were probably paying attention to and learning from, if not talking to folks at Ho-Chunk and others to to learn how they did what they did and then apply those models locally, right? So you see, in other words, when one community or a couple of communities start doing something, other communities kind of take cues from that and figure out how to build out these strategies that make it um, kind of successful and spread that that skill set and that capacity around. That's certainly what happened with gaming too. A few tribes experimented this with this in the 1980s. 
It got challenged, went up to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, yes, tribes can do this. Congress stepped in and passed a law kind of regulating it. But then tribes all over the place um, got into gaming because of the opportunity that it created to engage that, right? So it's a, it's a very dynamic and ongoing set of um, processes. We've got time for one last question here, and there are a lot we didn't get to in the chat, and uh, we'll do our best to post all of your resources you shared on our YouTube channel when we share your video. Um, but it seems like this book is important to the education of all Americans, uh, Meskwaki members, other Native groups, higher education, high school, libraries. Is there a, a plan to get the book distributed or into the hands of some of those stakeholder groups? Um. I mean, I think this is part of it, right? I mean, so it's available uh, for people to purchase, um, you know, talks like this that, you know, go out to folks in, in Iowa, in the area, um, raise awareness, you know, people can share it uh, with other folks, uh, try to get them to do that. But, you know, that's the kind of extent of what I'm able to do in terms of getting it, getting it out in the world, you know, um, as a, as a closing thought, one thing I'll say that I hope is interesting for people is, you know, you spend a lot of years working on something like a book. And then once it's out, you kind of have this realization where, you know, I kind of played a role in creating it. And certainly the squaggy people did as well. But now that it's in print, it kind of has a life of its own that I have. I don't have a lot of control over uh, what becomes of it. So if, you know, um, how people think about it, whether they like it, whether they don't like it, whether they share it with other people is sort of, you know, for them and the rest of the universe to decide. So, that's kind of the experience that I'm in right now. And we'll, we'll just um, sort of see what comes of it. And with that, we're going to bring our webinar to a close. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. And we'd like to extend one last thank you to our presenter, Eric Zimmer. We hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. There are many great stories to tell in the upcoming months. For more information and to register for future webinars in this series or to watch recordings, check out our website at history.iowa.gov. Looking to learn more Iowa history? You can find and watch over 90 recorded webinars of past 101 programs on the Iowa Culture YouTube channel. We look forward to virtually seeing you for the next Iowa History 101 webinar on November 14th. The topic will be On the Court, the History of Iowa High School Girls Basketball. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon.